So listen, if you're not going to married people, you're just flat out missing out. I don't know how else to sell it to you. We can't, can't play any funny videos and stuff like that. It is just going to be an incredible night. It is going to be so good. Like, it's just going to be good for your soul, right? Just to get out, hang out, man, go on a date night. Listen, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. My son's birthday is that day. I'm going to be at Mary People. He's five. He's not going to remember. He might remember. Don't tell him, okay? But wait, wait. <laughs> Sign up today. There's going to be a big rolly table out in the front. Do not miss out. I tell you what comes the 23rd and you realize you weren't there, you won't be missing out. People are going to be talking about it. Now, you're, you're astute people, I, I gather, I think. You're smart. And so you realize that I am not uh, really good looking, bald, and super jacked. So uh, I'm not Pastor Daryl. I'm Pastor Ryan. Similar. Yeah, there you go. Woo! I'll clap to that. Similar, but, uh, but different. Uh, Pastor Daryl is hanging out with Pastor Josh Rye up at Three Life Church. He is preaching right as we speak. And so listen, keep him in your prayers. They are doing incredible things up there. And they will be back for the second week of the series that I get to kick off today called It Takes a Village. And so since the, uh, the boss is away, let me try to sell you on a nice piece of commercial grade exercise equipment right here. <laughs> this incredible piece of machinery, look at this. This is fine. The German have just engineered an incredible thing here. It is... It is space-age aluminum. It's not aluminum. It's aluminum. It is just incredible. I mean, look at what it does. It just offers so much. But you know what? You wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't buy a car without test driving it, would you? Of course not. And so just for, you know, 99 payments of $999, this baby could be yours. But let's, let's boot her up. Let's see what she has to offer today. Oh, touch screen. It talks to you. It's, that's right. It is, it is like... Bluetooth. There's fans here. I'm going to choose to run through Hawaii. I, I ran through the uh, Alps in the first experience. Um, Hawaii it is today. So we're just going to get rocking and rolling here, see what she has to do. Now, this is, look at these arm rails. Man, I have up to bi- like up to date like heart rate monitor. I got to know beat to beat what's working here, okay? What's not working. That's not fast enough though. Let's keep going. Let's burn a few calories here. Listen, man, there is traction on this. Okay, we've got a little more traction here. There is a lot of traction on this that's going to just keep going. But, oh, man, it's incredible. It's, it's downright like I'm running on air. It's almost like, yeah, it's a cloud nine suspension system. You don't even feel like you're running. It's incredible. But you, you're smart people. You know that that's not enough. And practically speaking, you're not going to actually use this to run on it. So let me sell you on something else. Just in case, let me, let me give you the idea of what I call open concept storage. Okay? Now you can store not one, not two, but three full loads of laundry on this sucker. Check that out. That's right. Air drying. That's the way God intended it to be. Air dried out. But yet, but wait. There's more. You thought these handles were to keep you safe and to hold on to things and to get your heart rate, but that's where you'd be wrong. They are perfectly designed to hold your hands. <laughs> Look at that. And so, the best part is, it's so beautiful and it's so well designed that you may not want to use it at all. And then, you can move it from room to room and out into your garage where it will collect dust and act as a small jungle gym for your child. And then the best part, the coupe de grande, the piece de resistance, this thing, man, you can sell it gently used at your garage sale for a fraction of the price that you purchased it for. That's right. Now let's, um, this thing is incredible, and I was really running through the Hawaii. Um, it's really nice. I've been to Hawaii. This is not nearly as nice as Hawaii, but you get it. How many of you, be honest, or raise your hands. Have a piece of exercise equipment sitting in your house working as open concept storage right now. Yeah, there you go. It's okay. It's okay. The people sitting next to you who didn't raise their hand, it's not because they don't have it. It's just because it's in a room they don't go into very often, and so they don't have to use it, right? It's already behind something. Now, when you purchase this equipment, you did so, and maybe you've never thought about it this way. You did so because you are a believer, You believed in something. You believed in fitness. You believed in exercise. You believed in cardio. You believed in getting healthy. But belief is where it starts. 
Belief is why you started on this faith journey, or on the, oh, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Uh, belief is why you started on this exercise journey, but let's be perfectly honest with ourselves. Belief isn't going to do much for your waistline, right? Why? Because doing makes all the difference in the world, and you know this to be true. How many of you have exercised with a bad attitude? Yeah, yeah, right? Like, like, like you don't want to go, like, you have a terrible attitude about it, like, you're angry about it, yet, yet you went and you did something about it, and despite your belief that it wasn't doing any good, it actually did some good. Now, here's another thing about exercise, you may not have thought about it this way, but doesn't having a person to go with you make all the difference in the world? Doesn't it make all the difference in the world? Like, it's so easy to talk yourself out of getting up at 4.30 in the morning to go to the gym, and if you're that guy... I'm not that guy, but listen, if you're that guy, it's a lot easier if you have somebody waiting at the gym for you, especially if you have, you have taken that leap, right? And you are, you are paying someone to wait there for you and to, to train you. Why? Because accountability matters. Accountability absolutely matters. Now, because we're sitting in the church or because you're watching online and it says the journey church underneath it, or you're over in the outreach center, you can probably guess that what is true of exercise and exercise commercial grade equipment, and you can buy this sucker for $999 and 99 cents, uh, is true of our faith journey, our faith journey. Because see, every Christian, you're a believer. Now, everybody believes something, but there is a prerequisite to be a Christian. You have to believe in Christ. And, and, and you believe, right? You believe what the New Testament says. But as believers, we don't actually act out on what we believe all the time, do we? No. Right? We, we believe what the New Testament says. And we believe what Jesus taught. And we believe the claims about who Jesus was and, and who he said he was and what he did. But we don't actually forgive. But we don't actually love our enemy we don't actually get baptized even though jesus was super clear about baptism baptism next week by the way third and sixth of february first week of every month sign up today at the tent but we don't actually give we're not actually generous but we believe Woo! come out my beliefs i will roast you on facebook i will throw up an instagram i will retweet something i will throw up on snapchat all day because you came out my beliefs but we don't actually do what we believe, because doing makes all the practical difference in your life. And so if you've been coming here long enough, you know this to be true, but maybe, the, maybe this is your first time. Maybe you're, you're new here to the journey. So let me shed some light on kind of who we are as a church. That, that we, since, since the very beginning, have never been content with just belief. Like, that's where your journey of faith starts. See what I did their journey, you get it? But like, that's where it starts. But that's just the beginning. And let me give you an example. If Pastor Darrell believes, believes in his heart that he, he's supposed to leave Tennessee, believe his super lucrative job, and, and go home, displace his entire family, his adolescent girls, and come home and, and start a church, but he doesn't actually do anything about it, we're not sitting here today. You're not watching online. I love you online, people. Listen, you're not over in the outreach center watching. Listen. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people haven't taken their steps to becoming a Christian and salvation without Daryl actually doing something about that. And there's a Jesus word for that. It's called follow. It's called follow. Following Jesus makes all the practical difference in your life. It will make your life better. And consequently, it will make you better at life. And so I hope you discover today, and as we go through this series, It Takes a Village, that you can't follow Jesus in isolation. You can't do it alone. It takes a village. It's a we thing. And Paul, who, who steps on the stage of history about three to five years after Jesus was crucified, and what he was doing, he was trying to wipe Christians off the map. And then he had an interaction with Jesus, and all of a sudden he was like, I'm doing the wrong thing. Man, instead of trying to wipe Christians off the map, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go all over the Mediterranean basin, and I'm going to set up all these little, these little ecclesias, these little churches, and I'm going to master plan of evangelism. I'm going to supervise them. I'm going to send out these letters. I'm going to be like, hey, how you doing? How your mama been? Like, I'm going to check up on them. And those letters are what make up a lot of our New Testament. And Paul would say when he's talking to people like just like you and I about what it means to practically follow Jesus, what it, what it practically means to be a believer and then act on it, 
he underscores the fact that this is an extremely relational thing. That this is a, you can't do this solo thing. And if you go through the letters of Paul, if you, if you walk your way through the letters of Paul, he kind of gives you this, this list of what it means to actually believe and then act on it. I call it the one another list. It looks like this. Forgive one another. Accept one another. Care for one another. Encourage one another. Submit to one another. Restore one another. Carry one another. Endure life together with one another. Paul would say, if you're a Jesus follower, this is what it looks like to actually do it. To which you might reply, well, Pastor Ryan, like, that's cool and all. That sounds like a lot of work. I thought it was more like, like I would just pray and I would read my Bible every once in a while and I, I would give when the bucket came around. Maybe not all the time, but sometimes. And then I, I just wouldn't be a jerk to people. Paul would say, that's great, but no. And the interesting thing about this list, this one another list, you can't do any of it alone. You can't actually do any of it alone. It's not enough to believe it privately. You actually have to behave it publicly. Now, this is, this is a big deal because where, where, where I grew up in church, it was a very vertical idea of Christianity. It's kind of like, like God, how am I doing? Like, like okay, like, like, are you and I good? Have I done enough to be good? Like, I was moral today. Like, I didn't, I didn't do anything, like, really. Okay, I did some, okay, but like, it wasn't that bad. Like, and then, like, 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 I gave. I gave some money. And so I'm like, God, we're good. Okay, we're good. And, and there, wasn't a, there was no one another. It was purely vertical. God, how am I doing? Like, very eyes to the sky. But here's the problem with that. I discovered later on that being moral is extremely important. Being generous is extremely important, but it wasn't enough. And it, sell, it set me up to be extremely self-righteous, extremely self-righteous. And when you open up the New Testament, it's just nothing like that. And if you're purely vertical, what you th start to think is like, I don't, need, I don't need the people in the church. I don't need to get connected in a group. I don't need to get connected serving. I don't need to, man, I don't need to even have any friends that are Christians. You know what? Like, look at me. I don't have any Christian friends. Like, I'm, I'm the cool guy out in my group of friends, even though I go to church on Sundays, but I don't tell them about it. And what happens is you become extraordinarily self-centered. And it fosters these bad attitudes, things you don't really like to admit to, like elitism and legalism and judgmentalism, and racism, and then, and then, th I made this one up, but it plays here, like, you'll get it, like, the God's gonna get him -ism. okay, like, 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 we're the Christians, we're the good guys, we're sitting here, I did my job, but, like, but those are the sinners, and God's gonna get him -ism. and, like, I'm not gonna go hang out with those people, but it's quite, the, it's quite the opposite, Jesus says, listen, not only do I want you to hang out with those people, not only do I want you to love and love on those people and one another those people, but I want you to do so in such a way that they look at you and they go, that guy is crazy, but I want it. I want in on that. Whatever that is, I want in on that. And so we're going to look at a we're going to look at a book out of the New Testament called Hebrews. Now Hebrews, we don't know who wrote Hebrews. Uh, we think it was a dude. Could have been a lady. Doesn't matter. We think it was probably Paul or somebody who's studying under Paul, just because some of the vernacular and the verbiage that they use in that. But it, that really doesn't matter. What I want you to get caught up on is the fact that. The author, and the way the author just pivots between this vertical idea of Christianity and whether I'm good with Christianity, eyes to the sky, whether I'm good with God, God, you're good with me, and then pivots between that and this horizontal idea of, of one another. And back and forth. Check this out. Hebrews chapter 10. Here we go. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. Now, time out. He's writing to Jews predominantly Jews, and so they understood this terminology that you and I don't really use all that much. He mentions this, this holy of holies, right? This, this, what it was is there was this holy place in the center of the temple mount. You had the temple, and then this holy place that had curtains on either side, and a priest would go into that area from time to time at a very specific moment, and that's where God would kind of meet with his people, and the priest would go out and tell people, hey, this is what God told me. This is what we're going to do. But now... Fast forward a couple thousand years, the temple system's gone. It's been replaced by Jesus. And now we have this incredible thing. We have direct access to God. You and I have, I mean, can we stop for a second and just realize that you and I have direct access to the creator of the universe? Like, how incredible is that? Like, and so he's saying, listen, we have this direct access by a new, he continues, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, the curtains we talked about, that is his body. 
We had this old way of sacrificing animals and uh, for the atonement of, of human sins, and that's gone now because now we have physically sacrificed Jesus. He is, his blood has been shed, and so that's the new way. We kind of get to get out of the temple way, and now we're into the Jesus way. And what do we do when we get into the Jesus way? Well, continues. Let us, us draw near to God. So we're going to go direct eye to the sky, us and God, with a sincere heart. This is talking about your heart personally. Sincere heart with full assurance that faith brings. Completely vertical. This is how I grew up. But then there's this pivot. There's this change to this horizontal aspect. Right? It's like when you're like trying to bring a couch up like the third floor. Like, and you're like, pivot! Like, pivot! It's pivot, okay? You get it. He says this, let us, now it's a we thing, hold unswervingly, so just on tight, to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. So we had our eyes to the sky. We don't need a priest. We have direct access. Now the temple is gone, and the author says, but hey, just because the temple's gone, let us make sure to hold on to, to hold unswervingly, I love that word, onto the, th the practical things in our life, the practical things in our life that God has called us to do. Right? Unlike this private belief, which is very vertical, now we're going to talk about living it out in a horizontal way. And he gets super specific. And let us consider how we may spur on one another on. There's our phrase. There's our one another. He pivots from just you and I, God, to this extremely relational, this, this spur each other on extremely relational thing, and the interesting thing about this, and maybe you've never thought about this, is what the author is saying is, in your relationships, in your relationships at your house, in your relationships with the people that you're coming across in church, in your relationship with your believers that are around you, I want you to stir each other up. I want you to irritate each other. I want you to poke the bear a little bit. I want you to provoke each other in such a way that when you see your friends drifting, and right, and they're drifting off, and they're kind of losing their faith a little bit, that you have access, that you have permission to go, hey, mm, Let's come back over here. That doesn't seem like a good idea. Right? Or, or you, you got a couple and they're struggling with their son and they're struggling just to, just to figure things out. And, and, but you're like, you know what? I've been there. And you have access and you have permission. You go, hey, hey, hey. hey let's, 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 bring it, let's, let's bring it back a little bit. You have access and you have permission. Or someone has permission to talk into your life. When they see you doing something, like, hey, that's, that's not that great idea. That's, let's, let's not do that. It's very relational. And what, he, what, what the author is saying is, listen, this vertical thing, this access to God is incredible. But there's this horizontal piece that is absolutely 100% critical, that we need one another. But to what end? To what end? Something very practical. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards what? Love and good deeds. Love and good deeds. In other words, belief in action. In other words, the author's way of saying, you got to get on the treadmill. You got to actually do it. You got to actually run. Belief is how you started on this faith journey, but it's not going to do anything for your waistline unless you actually get on the treadmill. It's not going to do anything for you if that's sitting in your bedroom and you don't actually get on it. The author says you cannot afford not to. You can't afford not to have somebody spurring you on towards love and good deeds, encouraging you, encouraging you to make incredible decisions. So that you'll actually forgive, not just, I, I think I should probably forgive him. So that you'll actually love your enemies. Not just like, well, I'm supposed to love my enemies, but I just don't tell anybody what I'm really thinking, right? So you're actually putting others first. And then the author gets way up in your business, and way up in my business. And I, and I look at this and I'm like, how does he know? It was written like 2,000 years ago. How does he know? Spur on one another towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. Come on, somebody. Like, I read this, like, you got to read this like this is really happening because people really wrote this. It's not like, it's not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. It's like, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. Peter. James. I'm looking at you. Right, I look at it, I'm like, come on, somebody. I'm like, that's a sick burn. I'm like, get him. Go, oh, you got them. Here we go, right? But see, the preachers that I grew up in with, man, they, I'm telling you, you got to read it like that. If you don't read the Bible like that, you are missing out. I'm telling you, it's a good story. But the preachers that I grew up with, man, they would use that verse to get people to come to church and to sit in pews because that's how I did it. Man, I love sitting in pews, by the way. 
Because as a kid, you could hide in a pew. Like, you could lay down. Like, here you got the, like, slats you can, like, see through so the parents can, like, call you out. A pew, man, it'd be days before they found you. It's true. Don't try it out. It's terrifying for the parents, I'm sure. But what the author says is, listen, you can't afford to stop meeting with each other. Because if you do, there is going to be a deficit in your life. You're going to be missing out on something. And you're thinking to yourself right now, you're, going, you're doing the mental math. You're like, no, 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 Ryan, listen, listen, listen. You don't know me. I don't know you. I mean, I'm the lone ranger of Christianity. Like, I, I, don't, I, mean, I don't need anyone else. I don't, I, don't need the, I don't need the church as a whole. I'm getting what I need out of it. I don't need the church as a whole. I, mean, I, don't, I don't need relationships with other people. I certainly don't need people to have access to me. Listen, they have access to you. Facebook is not a personal diary, okay? Listen, people have access. They don't, listen, you want people to have access to you in a good way, not in a superficial way. Because see, the author of Hebrews and Jesus says, listen, if you think that way, well, then you don't know Christianity. This is a one another thing, and we don't mature past needing one another. Let me say it like this. There is a divinely designed correlation between community and faithfulness to God. There is a divinely designed correlation between not just, not just sitting in rows, and I love rows. I love that we get to come here and worship, but there's a divinely designed correlation between not just sitting in rows out here, but sitting face-to-face -face in circles, because circles are better than rows, and your faithfulness to God. There's a direct correlation between the two. And isn't it isn't funny every time if you were to talk about how like you you drifted away from the church, right? If you were to, if you were to get up here and tell your story because we drift, we all do. We, we don't put it a priority like we should in our lives. But if, if I brought you up here and you told your story, wouldn't it be interesting because it would probably correlate with drifting away from somebody in the church before it was actually drifting away from the church, right? Somebody somebody said something on the stage that you didn't like, it rubbed you the wrong way. It's not the fact that despite the fact that it was straight out of the Bible, like, but, you know, it didn't, it didn't hit you where you needed to get hit that day on Christianity, and so that's just not you. Or maybe somebody said something that offended you, and so you started to drift away because you drifted away from the people. Or maybe it's, maybe it's not something that vicious at all. Maybe you just moved, right? You were involved in a church before, but, like, you're in a new area with a new church, and, like, the new churches don't look like the old churches, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just not the same. And so you didn't set out to drift away, but now you're, you're eight months in, you're a year in, and you realize, man, I haven't been to church in that long. And, well, then things got tough. And you realize, you come to the unfortunate conclusion that there is nothing tangibly relational in your life. Now, what I, what I find even more compelling about this is that at the end of Jesus' ministry, he's kind of given this, like, farewell address. He's, he's, got, he's got the guys in the upper room. It's not the Great Commission. It's right before. He's got the guys in the upper room. He's just, he's just laying, on, laying things on pretty thick for him. He, just kind of, he's, he, knows about, he's, he knows what's about to happen. So he's trying to cover all the bases. And he, he gets there, and he's like, this is what's going to happen. This is where we're going. This is what we're doing. And, and he's just going. And Philip, we kind of walk onto the, the pages with Philip. And Philip's like, time out, Jesus. Like, I just, I'm not, I'm not picking up what you're putting down. And, and this is, these are my words. These are not Philip's words about the interaction, but you can read all about it. And John, Philip goes, listen, Jesus, I'm not sure what you're talking about. I don't know about the other guys in the room here. I, I'm just, I'm a little confused. Okay, I know you can see my thoughts. God, uh, I mean, Jesus, like, listen, I'm just, I'm real confused. I have no idea what's going on. But you, you say that you're, you're going and you're coming and you're going to prepare a place for us and then you're not. And, but then I, we can't go with you now and then we're going to go with you later. And like, I just don't get it. Okay. So Philip goes, listen, let me just level with you, Jesus. Just show us the Father. Right. Just show us God. Just show us the Father and that will be enough. And then, and then Jesus, you got to picture Jesus. He'll be like, <laughs> like, put his arm around him like, Philip, man. Phil dog, like, he says, listen, have I not been with you enough that you don't, you don't, like, recognize me? And then he says something, and it's so, we just read over it, but it's so blasphemous. It's so offensive in the Jewish culture. They, they should have stoned him to death. They really should have. They, they should have at least gotten up and left, but they, they didn't, and thankfully we get this part of the story from him because they didn't leave. And he, Jesus says, listen, if you have seen me, this is Jesus talking to his guys right before he's about to die. He says, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. We, we repassed it. We're like, oh, that's cool. Go, Jesus. You're like, no, that's so offensive. That's so ridiculous. 
culturally and contextually speaking, that's so ridiculous. But what he's saying is this, listen, Jesus is saying, listen, I am as close to the Father on this planet that you are going to get as far as understanding and seeing who the Father is. If you, if you look past me, you are looking past the Father. If you stop short of me, you are stopping short of the Father. I am as close to as it, as it gets for your understanding of what the Father is like here on earth. And then he's crucified. And he rises from the dead, he commissions the church, and he goes to heaven. And then Paul comes along, the same Paul we talked about earlier. He says, by the way, you know, you know how Jesus isn't physically here anymore? Yeah, like, well, it's not exactly true. He says, because, because you, church, you are the body of Christ now. It's not just me. It's not just Ryan. It's not just Pastor Daryl. It's not just Brandon. It's not just Kara. It's not just Rick. It's not just, no, no, no. You, we all together, collectively as a whole, we are the body of Christ. And then Jesus would say earlier in one of his most famous parables, he said, listen, as the body of Christ, we are going to have the opportunity, you are going to have the opportunity to take care of people, to work with people and to love each other. And when you do, it's like you took care of me. And, th and then they said to him, like you and I would say, be like, but Jesus, when did, when did we see you hungry? When, when did we see you tired? When did we see you sick? When did we see you hurting? When did, we, when did we see you homeless? And Jesus says, listen, as you did it to the least of these, it's like you did it to me. Wait, so let me get this straight, Jesus. How we treat and relate others here on this earth is a direct correlation to how we treat and relate to you. And Jesus says, you got it. And you know why? Because you are my body. And here's the moral. If you isolate from the body, if you isolate from the church, if you isolate from the people around you, the people of faith, you isolate from community, you are isolating yourself from the Father. Jesus says, listen, I am as close as you're going to get to seeing the Father here on earth, and you as a church are his body. And so when you isolate from the church, when you isolate from the relationships, when you isolate from the people around you, you are isolating yourself from the Father, and you aren't going to make it out there. If I chop this part of my arm off and lay it over there, it's not going to make it. When things get tough, because you know things are going to get tough. You don't have to be a Christian to know that things are going to get tough. But when things get tough and you have isolated yourself from the body, you are going to realize you don't have the support you needed. You don't have the relational support tangibly in your life. And you're going to be like, I don't understand why all this is happening to me. I don't get how we got here. And the Father in heaven is going to go, I got a perfect explanation for it. Because you isolated yourself from the body and therefore you isolated yourself from me. If you abandon community, you abandon one another, and chances are you are going to abandon your faith in some shape or another. And here's why. Community is where faith comes alive. Faith comes alive in community. Community is where you see faith work, and it's where you are challenged to work your faith. If you are not in community with other believers, what happens is, and I speak from a ton of experience with this, you become very self-centered. You become very self-focused. You become very short-sighted in your faith. It becomes all about you and yours instead of the us and we. And you're like, you're sitting there, again, you're doing the mental math right now, and you're like, I don't have time for other people. I don't have time for that. What you're really saying is, I'm too good for that. To which I would say, and I wrote this down in the last sermon series, but it plays here. People who think they're better than other people haven't taken the time to hear the stories of the people they think they're better than. People who think they're better than other people haven't taken the time to hear the stories of the people they think they're better than. In other words, as soon as you're in community, as soon as you're relationally bought in, as soon as you have that rapport, as soon as you are connected emotionally and you hear a story, and, and of course they hear your story because your story is one of perfection, right? Everything worked out fine and if everyone just thought exactly like you, the world would be a better place. The reason why I think you might think like that, I may have thought like that before, but when you hear their story, don't you just go, oh, oh, man, if I, if I had been raised like that, yeah, yeah, oh, man, if I had if I'd to grow up on that side of town, or if, if man, if, 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 if I had been taught like that, yeah, that, man, I probably would have, and I probably would have been just like you. You see, hearing people's stories, man, it brings people together. 
This is community. This is the body of Christ. And in the first century, it was so amazing. You had men, and can you believe it? Women. Woo! But you, you ready for this? You're not ready for this. You had Romans and Jews and Gentiles and slaves and slave owners. And you had free and you had rich and you had poor. And what brought them together wasn't prestige, it wasn't power, it wasn't works, it wasn't life, it wasn't money, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't any of that. It was Jesus. What brought them together was Jesus and it was so powerful and it so pleased the Father. And here's the thing, that hasn't changed. That hasn't changed. What the author of Hebrews says, listen, I can't believe it. I can't believe some of you have actually stopped meeting together with other believers. What are you, what are you thinking? You wanted to see results, but you got off the treadmill. Like, what are you thinking? You can't do this solo. You're divinely designed to not do it solo. You're divinely designed to one another one another. And he concludes... Not giving up meeting together, some are in the habit of doing, but what? Ah, encouraging one another. Encouraging one another because every single believer, no matter how strong you believe in what you believe, needs to be related with somebody emotionally, physically, tangibly, where they can encourage you, where you can one another one another. Why? Why? Well, first let me answer the question. What does it mean to encourage? It seems obvious to instill courage in somebody. It was obvious. But why? Why does it matter? Because it takes courage to live out your faith. It takes courage to live out your faith at Publix. It takes courage to live out your faith at your house. It takes courage to live out your faith at the soccer fields, especially if you're a coach or a parent. You know what I'm saying, okay? Listen, it takes courage to live out your faith in the neighborhood when you're talking to the, your next-door neighbor. The only time you talk to your next-door neighbor is when he's out mowing the lawn, and right, he's pushing the lawnmower, and you're like, I know he sees the bumper sticker on my car. I know he, goes to, I know he knows that I go to the Journey Church, and you, you, God has put it on your heart that you just have to talk to this guy, but it takes courage to actually do something, to actually talk. They know. They know who you are. It takes courage. Do you know it takes courage to actually act on what you believe at Christmas and at Thanksgiving dinners and at Taco Tuesdays at your own house? It takes courage. Courage to do what? The hard things. The selfless things. The generous things. Right? And if you're going to follow Jesus, and, and the, author, the author says, listen, if you're going to follow Jesus, not just about this, and this is incredible. Prayer is incredible. It's an incredible weapon. And it's not just about this. It's not just about sitting in rows. And sitting in rows in corporate worship is incredible. But it's, a, it's, it's, it's about this. Being in community means you're encouraged when you need it. But it also means you're encouraged when you don't even want it. So here's my question for you. Is anyone, outside of what your like, significant other or your family dynamic, is anyone spurring you on to live out your faith? Does anyone have permission? Does anyone have access? Or have you given up meeting together as some in the first century have done? Well, let me ask it to you like this. Have you ever met together? Or are you too good for it? You don't have enough time for it, right? Your entire Christian experience has been sitting in rows, listening to a talking head. We sing a couple songs, one of which you know, two of which you kind of daydream through, right? And then somebody asked you for money, and then you just count down the seconds until lunch. Is that it? Have you ever, have you, have you ever sat in a circle? Because circles are so much better than rows. Have you, have you ever joined a team? Served on a team? Have you ever joined a group? And here's why it matters. Here's why it takes a village. Myself and more importantly, the leadership here at this church, Pastor Daryl and Kara and Brandon and Jackie and the whole lot, everybody, all the pastors, Brian and Tommy and everybody in between, everybody, everybody that we do life together with here is not just content for you to believe. We're just not. This church, but more importantly, the big C church, the church of the first century, since the very beginning, 
has been all about engaging our culture with the irresistible love of Jesus Christ with the purpose of helping people take, and our mission statement says their first step towards him because that's our mission here at the Journey Church. But I want to put it on you just a little bit harder because you're like, oh, I already took my first step. Guess what? I changed it. It says take your next step towards him. Your next step. Because here's the thing. Here's the kicker. You can't engage culture by yourself. You can't do it in isolation. You can't. And if you think you can, the author of Hebrews and Jesus would tell you, then you don't know Christianity. So here's the deal. I'm going to close here in a couple minutes and uh, stand you up. We'll pray out. We'll leave on a high note and then you get to go. You're free. Or there's going to be some tables out in the lobby, some high top tables. And they have groups and all the different ways you can serve and all the different ways you can get connected through a group because it really does take a village. And it really does take permission. It really does take access. And you're thinking to yourself, ah, they probably don't have a group for me. Well, are you a man? Are you a woman? Then we got you covered. <laughs> we got those. But maybe you're like, oh, well, like, I'm new. I'm new to this whole Christianity. I don't even know if I am a Christian. Perfect. We got groups for that. You know we have a Christianity 101 for women? We got that. We got you covered. Do you, oh, you're like, oh, well, like, man, I'm like, I'm struggling with some things, Ryan. I'm struggling with some things. And like, you don't have access to me, so you don't understand what I'm going through. You don't, act, you don't, you don't, I'm just addicted, and I just, man, I just, I'm just struggling with those things. You know we got a group for that. Wednesday nights, incredible group. 18 to 25-year-olds, I'm looking at you right now. I see you. You stand out just as much as you think you do. <laughs> Did you know? I'm just going to lay some statistics on you. Did you know that no matter how strong you believe in what you believe right now, right now, that by the time you turn 26, 85% of you will have given up on your faith completely, like you never had it. And you don't think you have time for a group? You don't think you have time to have Caleb and Bly Baker pour into you? Incredible people with an incredible story that all they want to do is hear your story? Thursday night, 6.30, right here. Or maybe, maybe, maybe you want to go a little bit deeper. You're like, oh, Ryan, you know, I, I've, been, I've been a Christian for a while. I've been doing this thing, but I want to go, I want to answer some of the tough questions. I want to know why God lets bad things happen to good people. Man, I want to know what science has to say about Christianity. You know what? We got a, we got a class for that. We got a group for that. Wednesday nights, right here in the auditorium. I'm inviting you. I'm the leader. You should come. No excuses. We have child care. We got child care for the little kids. We got child care for the big kids, which leads me to my next statement. Your kids, when you drop them off today, guess what? They got put in a small group. They have small group leaders. Do you know why? Because it's important. It's important for them to understand one another. If it's good enough for them, then it's good enough for you. And so here's the deal. Let's all stand to our feet. I'm going to pray us out. And you have an opportunity to leave the treadmill in open concept storage mode. Or maybe you can go hang out and find out a little bit more about groups. Maybe a little bit more about serving. And why the Journey Church believes it takes a village. So let's pray. God, we are so thankful for what you are doing in this house. We're so thankful for everything that you allow us to just have vertical access to you. That we can look at you and you can look down at us and that we have, we have access to the creator of the universe. It's incredible. But God, we know there is this horizontal part that is absolutely 100% critical. But sometimes, man, we just, it's tough. It's tough. So God, I ask that you would just place on the people's hearts here what they need to do to take their next step towards you. Whatever that is. Whether it be the first step of baptism, obedience, whether it's joining a group, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's leading a group, maybe they have a home and they don't want to leave a group, they just, they just want to be a part of something and they want to open up their home. Maybe that's what it's like. Whatever that is. God, we thank you that you that you can be trusted to give us that information. We love you. We love you most of all for what you did sending your son 2,000 years ago to die on a cross for us that we don't have to spend eternity without you. We love you. We love what you're doing here at the Journey Church. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll see you back next, next week. Pastor Joe will be back for the second week of It Takes a Village. Have a good day.